Missouri is once covered by tall grass prairie, reportedly as tall as an explorer on horseback. The Missouri Department of Conservation is cooperating with landowners and others to maintain the remaining prairies. We'll learn more next on Show Me Ag. Welcome to Show Me Egg. I'm your host, Kyle Vickers. Missouri used to have millions of acres of prairie covering large swaths of its landscape. It was not only grass, but hundreds of plant and animal species that thrived on these acres. The Missouri Department of Conservation is working with farmers and private groups to preserve and protect the remaining prairies and even to reestablish some of the traditional flora. We have with us Max Alliger with the Department of Conservation to explain why it is important and how they can help private landowners. Max, let's talk a little bit about the history of Missouri, once covered with millions of acres of prairie grass. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, about 15 million acres uh, along the west and northwest side of our state was originally tall grass prairie, the eastern edge of uh, really what could be considered the Great Plains. Uh, it was a fairly tree-free environment with those rich, deep prairie soils that were built by centuries and centuries of uh, deep roots uh, that uh, fed from minerals far below. I, I can actually remember reading accounts by early explorers in western Missouri of riding for miles with grass as tall as a man on horseback. Yes, there were certainly spaces like that. There were also uh, herds of uh, grazing animals, elk and bison, that created much shorter, sparser areas. And we really think it was that mix of short and tall grass across the landscape that provided uh, great wildlife habitat for so many species. And that's really, uh, that's part of what's important to the Department of Conservation is really your, your mission is to provide uh, for wildlife and, and there was a great variety of wildlife, wasn't there? Oh, absolutely, from, from large grazing animals to small rodents and reptiles and of course insects that occurred nowhere else. What made that prairie special was the diversity of life. And it's, it's not always easy to appreciate as you drive through a prairie landscape at 70 miles an hour. It's a, it's a resource that you have to become familiar with. You have to stop and walk and look down and get to know some of the two to 300 plants that may live there and uh, the other forms of life that depend on that. And as I said, we, we had 15 million acres at one time, but we've converted so much of that to other uses that we've got, we think, around 80,000 acres uh, in this day and time, less than one half of 1% of that native tall grass prairie remaining in Missouri. So the pieces that remain are precious to us as a, as a storehouse for the plants and animals that uh, uh, represent a piece of Missouri's heritage. And increasingly, they're becoming economically important as a seed source as we try to establish new grasslands on, on private lands as well. So some of those prairies can be harvested for seed but, uh, in, in a kind of a difficult procedure, I believe. But, uh. Uh, it takes some work. You've got to get uh, any uh, invasive plants uh, off the area so you don't have uh, a seed source that might be contaminated by species that you don't want, but certainly with a few management steps, you can come in and do anything from hand harvest to mechanically harvest using uh, what we call a flail vac. It's basically a large nylon brush on a, on a front loader of a, of a mid-sized tractor, and we uh, harvest a lot of seeds from prairies that we manage. A lot of people, and I love driving through grasslands. I love going out in Kansas through those uh, prairies, but one of the uh, real attributes is the flowering plants that are out there in, in the truly native prairies. Yeah, it's a gorgeous place to be, and it changes every week. Uh, you can have two to 300 species of different blooming plants that, that come throughout the year, really from March all the way into October. Uh, the fall prairie uh, changes color. The grasses kind of get a dark, a dark red, almost purple hue at times, and the, the sumac tur turns a flame red, and you've got those fall blooming asters and other wildflowers that really make it a very inviting place to go this time of year. So we've got some of these uh, na natural uh, habitats left with, that have literally never been tilled by plow. We, we have a, a little bit of that on our farm, and you can still see mounds that were left by some ancient peoples. Yeah, Kyle, that's exactly right. What makes a native prairie special is that it's never been tilled, and there's relatively little of that left today. But we, we do have some people trying to establish warm season grasses, some of the traditional prairie grasses, you mm -hmm. mentioned the seed harvest, so they're taking some ground that may have been in farmland in the past, right. and they're, they're trying to reestablish that, and how's that going? Well, it's going really well. Uh, in some cases, I know we're gonna talk about one today, but. 
uh, of the process of bringing cropland back into a native warm season grass planting or even a fescue pasture back into a prairie construction planting uh, makes sense uh, economically. You can spread out your forage base uh, over the course of the year to provide some much needed summer forage when fescue, as we know, is not at its best. Um, and there are uh, different routes you can take. You can, you can have a mix that's mainly for grazing or you can have a much more diverse mix that provides blooming plants throughout the growing season for pollinators and uh, any of those things will uh, benefit small game species like Bob White quail and rabbits. We're going to come back and converse a little bit more about this later, but let's see how one farmer in Mora, Missouri, worked with his local private land conservationist to try to reestablish some prairie grasses on his farm. Where they rolled that ryegrass down. down well, the Department of Conservation developed uh, a private land services division back in 1999. Actually, our newest uh, division, youngest division within the agency, and uh, it, we were created to strictly focus on helping landowners improve their properties for whatever their land uses might be. For a lot of folks that's recreation, but for some of them it's uh, production, particularly ag production. And so what we're really in the business of doing as, as a whole is to try to restore native cover types back to Missouri's landscape for a variety of reasons. Uh, one being wildlife habitat. Uh, with that comes increased landowner recreational opportunities, and uh, but also a real side benefit is is that we can ag producers can recognize a lot of good opportunities for profitability to their operations, and so for all those reasons, uh, we focused a lot of effort on trying to help landowners uh, convert portions of their ag operations over to native cover types. In this case, native warm season grasses that can provide good valuable forage for them and help increase their profitability while helping the landscape and, and wildlife habitat at the same time. I'm fifth generation on this farm. It goes back to 1852. Um, it's always been kind of a combination of crops and cattle. Um, I chose to mainly go with cattle and grazing, so most of the farm has been converted to grass um, with exception of some acreage that I'm going to run some summer and winter annuals on. I figure you'd need about a third of your farm in warm season grasses and I love wildlife. I grew up fishing and hunting and we don't have as many wildlife around here as what we had when I was a kid and I'm trying to do whatever I can to get that back and uh, native grass seemed to be the way to go. It's great for wildlife. One day uh, Dave Niebri with the Conservation Department approached me and asked me if I'd be willing to do an experiment uh, with plant native grass and summer annuals. Um, I said sure. I was kind of wanting to plant some native grass anyway and I set aside 20 acres to do that with and uh, the experiment was normally when you plant native grass you have to wait three years for establishment before you can utilize it. Uh, with this experiment we planted summer annuals the same time we planted the native grass and uh, as soon as those came up and were ready to graze um, I hot wired off the field um, I grazed at a rate of 50,000 pounds per acre per day and the experiment was whether or not the cattle would hurt the establishment of the native grass and once it took about three days for the cattle to realize that those native native summer annuals were tasted really good and they at that point they quit eating the native grass and they started eating the summer annuals. I have definitely seen a increase in wildlife. Um, when I moved on, on, took this farm over, I uh, saw very few quail. It was a rare, rarity to see quail. Now I regularly see two coveys out here. Uh, probably three times as many rabbits. Of course, there's plenty of predators. There's more predators now too. And but it's working because those, you know, that game has cover uh, to get away from those predators. And so what I'm doing here is working. I'm definitely seeing an increase in wildlife. In my opinion, the experiment uh, was, was very much successful. Uh, it was This particular thing is something that no one in our agency had ever tried before. I wasn't aware of anybody ever trying it before. But I'd been to a, uh, there's certain people out there, some grazing consultants that are really starting to uh, advocate the use of annual forages in grazing systems. And uh, I really saw the benefit of that. Because those annual forages can really fill a void during the, the year when other perennial forages are not producing very well. And uh, so we wanted to try to incorporate that into some uh, grazing systems. 
And when Johnny came to me uh, shortly after I learned about that and asked about establishing native warm season grasses on his property, um, one, of the, one of the big hangups for producers to do that, to, to take the jump and, and make that conversion, is the, the lag in forage during that establishment period. Uh, as Johnny said, you know, usually you're looking at at least two to three growing seasons before your native warm season grass is established to the point where it's ready to be grazed. So that two to three year loss of forage is really what, what you know, concerns people about, you know, biting the bullet and taking the, going into this conversion process. So I had the idea that maybe we could fill that gap with these annual forages, these cover crop cocktails that we refer to. And uh, I asked around if anybody had tried trying to use those as a nurse crop and grazing them while we were establishing warm season grasses and nobody had. And luckily I had a pretty uh, proactive producer in Johnny Brower who was willing to, uh, to, to, to be a part of that experiment and try it out. So we did that. Uh, and as he mentioned in 2014, we planted the annual cover crop and warm season grass perennial stand at the same time. And uh, for the first couple seasons, basically grazed the cover crop off the top and used that as a high, really high quality forage during the summer months while we were growing young warm season grass uh, seedlings underneath. This farm, I'm hoping to turn it back natural like it was you know, I'm fifth generation on this farm for my great great grandfather, probably a lot what it looked like when he bought this land and started out and and hopefully someday have the wildlife that he had back then on this farm as well. And I have to mention, you know, by managing the farm for wildlife, my cattle are not suffering whatsoever. I'm managing it in a way that the cattle benefit as well as the wildlife. There's a way that both can benefit from without either one suffering. It's all in how you manage a farm. If you'd like to learn more about managing your grasslands, you can visit the department website or find help at your local office, and that may be a Department of Conservation office or the USDA Soil Conservation office. Th this experiment was just fantastic. I really enjoyed our afternoon there. Johnny had done an awful lot of work, as well as David, in trying to, to uh, use a new method of getting this going. Johnny did a lot of work, and, and <laughs> it's always a joy to work with uh, any cooperator who uh, is is up to try something new, uh, he, he's a high energy individual who who kept us on our toes as we went through it. Always had good questions, and and in the end, we had good results. You always discover uh, a few new obstacles and a few new opportunities. What we're most excited about is, as Dave very clearly pointed out uh, in that segment, is the opportunity to provide better forage quicker without that second year of waiting for your native warm season grasses to, to come in and get established. And we think that the use of these uh, mixed uh, summer annual cover crops as a nurse crop uh, planted at the same time that you establish your native warm season grass seed may be a way to do that. Uh, not only don't you have to wait a year to get your native warm season started, but you really get a mid to late summer period with some pretty exceptionally high energy forage plants there in that establishment field. Why is this this type of grass so much better or so important for the wildlife as opposed to say traditional uh, fescue clover pastures? Yep, a lot of times our introduced grasses tend to be sod forming. Uh, the way that they're grazed and this their basic growth habit, they, they tend to f uh, form a very tight sod at the ground level uh, and then they can be grazed down almost completely to the, to the ground level. So it's kind of an all or nothing proposition. Uh, you don't get a mix of some bare ground and short short grass along with some overhead cover, um, which the native bunch grasses uh, tend to provide. Uh, that stand of uh, native warm season grass may have looked like a pretty solid stand, but if you get down and look and peel those grass tops back, you see a very clumpy structure, which provides travel paths for wildlife to to get under and, and search for bugs and scratch for seeds and escape predators. And it really is the, the exact type cover that uh, they evolved with on the prairie. So. Johnny mentioned quail and it's really nice to see quail kind of coming back. We, we've kind of experienced that at our farm from when I was a young man and uh, lots of quail around and then we didn't have any, we've got a few more. What about prairie chickens? Now that's something that I think, I can remember a few flocks of prairie chickens when I was a young man, very rare in Missouri now. Yep, they are very rare. Uh, in fact, we've probably only got a couple of functional populations of greater prairie chickens left in the state, one of which uh, is down in that St. Clair County area 
between uh, Eldorado Springs and, and Taborville. Uh, probably about 50 to 60 birds uh, from year to year in that population. The trick with prairie chickens is that you have to provide everything from short to tall to sparse to dense cover types uh, fairly much adjacent to each other and then you have to replicate that mix across a large landscape. And that landscape also needs to be fairly free of tall trees or other things that block the vista. It's been said that prairie chickens are as much a, a creature of the, the sky as they are of the land. And any place that we have fragmented habitat, whether that be from power lines or tall hedgerows of trees that weren't there under native conditions, they don't do well in those landscapes. So we do what we can uh, on our larger protected prairies. We work a lot with uh, other groups like the Nature Conservancy of Missouri and the Missouri Prairie Foundation uh, to jointly manage uh, some prairies in cooperation. But you know, the vast majority of our grassland acres in these landscapes, it's in private ownership. So we need people like Johnny Brower and we, we do everything that we can to find ways to work with them in, in ways that make economic sense. Uh, we know that they're there to make a living. Uh, they have uh, living expenses uh, just like any other family and that has to come from the land. So we, we often work with uh, folks to try to find a way to do a little bit better for wildlife when, within the economic realities that they face. Uh, you know and, and I know and others that sometimes the Department of Conservation gets a little bit of a bad rap in, uh, from farmers and, and other landowners. Part of that is their enforcement provisions. But you guys have really reached out to try to help uh, private landowners uh, manage their farms uh, economically as well as to manage for wildlife. Yep, we've really done that since the department started in 1937. Uh, we've always had an active private landowner outreach program, whether that's uh, been through our conservation agents or uh, folks in our wildlife division. Uh, for the last uh, several years, it's been through this dedicated division of uh, private land services, folks like Dave Niebrig, uh, whose job it is to go out and, and understand uh, federal and state incentive programs, listen to the landowners and see what it is that they want to accomplish on their property, and find an economically viable way to help them uh, make their plans uh, a reality. Whether that's uh, better deer hunting on a recreational uh, piece of ground in North Missouri, or whether that's a little bit quail habitat uh, on a working farm uh, over in the Osage Plains. Uh, everything we do is based on what that landowner is trying to accomplish and try to guide them as best we can to, to, to access public funds that may be available, whether those are from the U.S. Department of Agriculture or from other sources. Well, let's talk about some of those funding yep. mechanisms, but first of all, tell us a little bit about how that's organized. I, I mentioned earlier, Dave works out of a, a USDA office. And, and there are others right. stationed around the uh, state as well. Right. There's a private land conservationist in all 114 counties in Missouri. Um, we, we tend to find things by Googling anymore, so you can certainly Google the phone number and office location of your private land conservationist. Uh, oftentimes they are in a USDA service center. Sometimes they're located in one of our offices, and it's their job to uh, find some time and come out and walk the land and, and hear what it is you want to accomplish. and, and Try to try to get things headed down uh, that path for you. And there are some funding mechanisms available to, to maybe help with some of the costs of, of working with wildlife and, and grass. There are. I, I would be remiss not to start by talking about the Natural Resources Conservation Equip program. Certainly the most uh, deeply funded program that addresses wildlife habitat. Our Missouri Department of Conservation does have some funding from from year to year uh, to do certain. Uh, practices on private land, and in our uh, prairie chicken geographies, in our native prairie geographies, for landowners who want to uh, restore a native prairie, uh, remove trees from uh, part of that area, or take a crop field or fescue pasture and turn it into something like Johnny Brower did, uh, there are usually some funds available to help do that on a on a year to year basis. Are there also, we did a show recently about the state parks and soils tax, so there is some state money as well. Is some of that available for yep. these yep. purposes? The, the latter funds I talked about would have come from our Department of Conservation, but certainly if uh, producers are renovating a pasture and need to rebuild uh, some of the infrastructure that goes with a grazing system, the uh, natural resources uh, soil and water conservation tax is uh, certainly uh, providing program benefits that uh, 
are available to many folks. You personally have a, a statewide mission to work with grasslands. How, how are we doing? I know that uh, there's lots of issues, conservation having to do with climate change, soil erosion. There's lots of different things. How, how are we, where we stand on have, getting our grasslands productive and yet conservation minded? I think we make strides. Uh, we, we continue to face many of the challenges that we've, we've faced uh, as a conservation community. And uh, I, I guess one of the most timely is that when we see a sharp uptick in commodity prices, there's, <laughs> there's always an interest in converting some more of those acres to, to annual row crops. And I understand that motivation, uh, but I think there are opportunities to, to profit from these remaining acres of native prairie uh, through, through the harvest of seed. You know, the Conservation Reserve Program and the other government programs that uh, are putting habitat back out on the ground need a lot of seed right now. Mm -hmm. So that's a viable enterprise to think so about. There's a lot of demand for that there as well. Is. Yeah. And I think generally as, as the, the public in general becomes more interested and aware of what Missouri once was, uh, we do see more support for uh, adding habitat back that uh, represents a piece of our cultural heritage and part of our history and can support uh, strong, resilient uh, pockets of really great habitat out there. Are we getting the research, the basic research we need uh, through our university system to, to help you do your job? You know, we do cooperate with the university on, on a number of fronts. Uh, one, of the, one of the folks I cooperate with uh, the most is the beef and dairy economist for University of Missouri Extension. He helps us understand uh, some of the economic realities that, that affect our projects. We do a lot of research ourselves as well. We've got a uh, grassland field science research station at the Clinton office just down the road and we're involved with a lot of aspects of coming to understand the interactions of prescribed fire and grazing and how that affects the habitats, how that affects uh, the diversity of plants and uh, it, it's a continual learning curve. One of the things that was very interesting to me about the Brower uh, operation, he mentioned uh, the grazing rate at 50,000 pounds per acre. Yes. And he did that, he scaled that down because I think he had one third acre patches or something. But anyway, the, the grazing, the way you manage grazing can make a big difference in a lot of things, wildlife and conservation, but very much a difference in the productivity. Yeah. Well, stock density, as anyone who, who manages livestock knows, is a almost magical tool for, for coaxing uh, extra production out, out of your acres. And that 50,000 pounds per acre uh, figure is not at all uh, outrageous within some of the new adaptive grazing approaches that, are, that folks are taking where they move uh, their livestock daily or even multiple times a day through fairly small paddocks uh, to try to increase soil health, to try to uh, increase the, uh, the value, the, the nutritional value of the forage that they get. Uh, I certainly am not that familiar with those practices, but uh, I think those systems can work for wildlife as long as we find a way to uh, protect and, and maintain some cover uh, for nesting and brood rearing that, that quail or, uh, or other wildlife might need. I certainly don't know why uh, we, we couldn't discover ways to make that all work together. Yeah, I, from what I've read, that's, that goes hand in hand. The livestock seem to thrive, but also the wildlife and, and uh, uh, the, the, all the fauna that's in a pasture yeah. really thrives in that system as well. And also that you can almost double your production by, by following one of these programs. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with those programs. I will say that uh, as, as an agency, uh, the Conservation Department uh, looks more and more to grazing as a very positive grassland management tool. Uh, we've reintroduced fire and grazing on several of our public prairies, and we really think that that replicates the cycles of disturbance and recovery that happened across the landscape when the native grazing animals came through. And we've seen uh, wildlife from, from cottontail rabbits to northern bobwhite to greater prairie chickens show a clear preference for areas that have a mix of grazed and ungrazed and burned and unburned cover. Kind of trying to mimic the uh, um old days where you had buffalo that came through and occasional prairie fires, right. uh, those things, you can try to mimic them and see how it turns out. Yes, grazing animals follow fire and we try to capitalize on their behavior of, of wanting to spend more time grazing that most recently burned, highly nutritious, lush grass. And that's something you can replicate at home too. Real briefly, uh, as climate changes a little bit, how, how is Missouri's grassland gonna cope? Can you, can you give us a little <laughs> bit of a prediction on that as things, I, are, I, are, do you already see things changing? You know, I cannot do much of a prediction. I, 
I, I do think we can look to, to hydrologic data that's been collected, well, for a very long time. Missouri's climate has become uh, more and more wet, uh, especially beginning in the 1980s. Uh, the, the past 30 years or so has, has been a much wetter period than what came before. Uh, we don't know what the future holds, but we do know that in periods where there is uh, ample to, to extra rainfall, it favors uh, woody plants and it favors the growth of trees and shrubs and brush on our open grassland landscapes. And that's one of the consequences we've dealt with as public land managers is uh, keeping some of those, uh, it, they're, they're native trees, but they're still invasive of that prairie ecosystem. And it's changed the frequency with which we have to burn and do other management to keep our prairies open. I know that many of these areas are open to the public. You've got a field day coming up near El Dorado Springs. Uh, we do. The, the, uh, later in September. Yep, uh, Saturday, September 17th at Wakanta Prairie which is just about three miles north of El Dorado Springs. Uh, we would love for folks to come out and get to know that site. And uh, we've got wildflower walks and we've got wagon rides that'll take folks to the top of the hill. You can get a glimpse of what that native prairie really was like when uh, the first European settlers would have arrived. Uh, There's games for kids and the St. Clair County, County cattlemen are, are uh, going to have a lunch concession there as well. <laughs> sounds, so come, come on out. Sounds like a lot of fun. Unfortunately, yeah. that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you, Max, for being with us tonight, and to David, and to the Browers for allowing us to visit their farm. That's all the time we have for tonight. Before we go, we'd like to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Show Me Ag. Be sure to tune in next time for another look at a topic touching rural Missouri. For everyone here at Cam West and myself, good night. We're also very interested in what you have to say. So if you have feedback you'd like to share with us, you can email us at showmeag at camos.org or find us on Facebook 